Good afternoon. This is Safe and Safe Country podcast and me, its author and host, Lina Frolova. Just to remind you that we are speaking here about the security and defense, security of the country, of Europe, of people, how the world will operate after this big war, uh, when the war will end, what means European security and many other issues, which we discuss here and try to find answers on the most important question. This podcast is produced jointly by the Center for Defense Strategies, Ukrainska Pravda, and Media Center Ukraine. You can find us on the resources of Ukrainska Pravda, as well on largest podcast platforms, Apple, Google, Spotify, SoundCloud, and others. Don't forget to subscribe. You will receive updates and you will be among the first who will listen new episodes. Today we will speak about the people who may be the most suffered from this war, the most vulnerable groups. We will speak about refugees. We will speak about internally displaced person. Uh, how their life is organized, how they pass through adaptation, what are their plans for the future and what Ukraine should do and the world should do for those people to come back. And my guest today is Karen Whiting, Deputy Representative of the UN Refugee Agency in Ukraine. Welcome. Thank you very much. You was born in Ottawa. Yes, you yes. are like a Canadian representative in this international community. Yes. <laughs> uh, but you had like a quite uh, um, impressive experience of working with refugees. You was uh, facing the uh, refugee problem in Syria. You was based in Baghdad for some period. Tell me, is there any differences between all those problems which arise in these different type of wars which we face? I mean, certainly the context is different in every country that you go to and the reasons for which um, people are forced to, to flee their homes are, are different. Um, but in many cases, the work that we do is quite similar, particularly for myself. I work in what we call protection. So all those actions that help people um, restart their lives and access their rights and services. Um, so there are a lot of similarities, but of course, every context touches you in a particular way. Yeah, that was one of the questions. How you like uh, continue to be with this job? You face so many like personal uh, tragedies and you try to help so many people. How to save like in normal condition with all this? Well, I don't face personal tragedies. I mean, I um, deal with the, and I think that's the important thing for humanitarian workers to remember, is that we're here to support um, forcibly displaced persons um, and to help them restart their lives. So I think for me, my job is incredibly rewarding because I know that the work that we do makes a difference in individual lives of women, boys, girls, and men. And I mean, while much of the work that we do um, deals with crises and emergencies and, and difficult situations, there are some incredibly rewarding moments, like when you help um, a person to obtain the identity documentation that they need to access services, or um, which is increasingly rare these days, where you get to support um, a refugee to find, um, you know, a durable solution such as return home or resettlement or integration into the country where they are. So I think the fact that my job is, you know, continually changing, but also so personally rewarding is what helps uh, me to continue uh, to work in difficult conditions. And when mission was established here and when you arrived? So the UNHCR office in Ukraine was established in, in 1996 and has been working for a number of years uh, with the government of Ukraine to support uh, refugees here in Ukraine from other countries and from uh, 2014 onwards also working together with internally displaced Ukrainian nationals as well as um, persons at risk of statelessness, so persons with an undetermined mm -hmm. nationality. I myself arrived in Ukraine in April of 2022 as part of um, what we call the emergency response team, which was um, sent here to increase UNHCR's capacity um, to respond and to support the government's emergency response um, to the full-scale invasion by the Russian Federation in February of 2022. You know that UN principle is now under the great criticism because of the slow reaction on many actions. But uh, response team, you said, arrived in April. So it's quite fast reaction for international community to react. What was your task here and how you managed to make it so fast? 
<laughs> well, I mean, UNHCR had been here already and had been responding already from the first days. And so, you know, we had our team here was already responding from the very beginning. I myself came uh, on an emergency mission from the office in, in Rome, um, so where UNHCR deals with sea arrivals from the central Mediterranean. And so I arrived here in April, as I said, and um, was tasked with supporting and the upscaling of of UNHCR's protection response. So everything that has to do with psychosocial support, uh, legal assistance, response to gender-based violence, um, and all those activities that support uh, the protection of children. And now your work is split. What is the main focus or did it change within this uh, one and a half year in Ukraine or with Ukrainian refugees? So I think now my work and certainly the work of UNHCR is shifting a little bit. So we still have emergency response, mm -hmm. certainly in the east and the south of the country along the, the front line. Your people so are physically located there, some part of the team, yes? UNHCR has offices in 10 locations, including in areas in the east and in the south, close to the front line. But we also, um, you know, have mobile teams and participate in what we call interagency convoys, um, which provide direct material assistance to people in need on the front line. But as I was saying, there has been a shift in my work, but also the work of UNHCR as a whole, um, to look more at early recovery, reconstruction, community recovery, because there are parts of the country, and in particular, I think it's the government's focus to begin reconstruction, recovery, mm -hmm. where it is possible to do so. And so for UNHCR, we've really shifted in the last couple of months to have a big focus on what we call durable solutions. So helping people to find either solutions where they've been able to return home or for people who are unable to return home to support them to integrate and to be productive members of the communities where they're currently displaced. And you said that you have 400 people in your office, yes, now here in Ukraine? Yes, so we have about 400 staff, including about 75% of them who are Ukrainian nationals, correct? Mm -hmm. Quite big. Okay, let's shift to uh, your perception or your knowledge about our refugees and IDPs. I read a few of your reports, which are called Leaves on Hold. It's like a constant monitoring, let's say, from time to time, once per three months, is yes, I believe. Yes. Monitor of the... Uh, refugees, of their moods, of their intentions. And you also edit now IDP's research. So can you give like uh, some kind of brief of what's going on and how the situation is changing? Sure. So as you said, um, UNHCR has been conducting a series of surveys of uh, the intentions and situation of both refugees and uh, internally displaced um, Ukrainians here inside Ukraine. So um, in July, we published a joint report, which is the fourth survey of refugees and the second survey of internally displaced persons. So essentially, these are phone surveys that we conduct on a periodic basis. So as you say, about every three months to better understand the intentions, but also um, the hopes and the concerns of both refugees and internally displaced persons, um, which will help not only UNHCR um, to better program uh, and to plan how best to support um, governments to support refugees mm -hmm. and internally displaced persons, but also to help us advocate for increased support, both for Ukrainian refugees who are displaced abroad, but also here inside Ukraine to support the recovery of Ukraine, but also the ongoing support to internally displaced Ukrainians. We're speaking now about uh, like 11 uh, million people who were moved or Uh, inside Ukraine or outside, uh, around six million which are staying, still staying um, abroad and five million inside Ukraine. Figures are huge. I mean, that's something which Europe didn't face uh, since the Second World War. And uh, do you have the understanding of how to work and how to manage such a big figures, yes, uh, from the point of view of settlement of all the um, problems you issued, from the point of view of communicating to them, especially to those who are staying abroad, to keep the contact with them, to support them abroad. And 
Do you think that Ukraine as a state, not only the government, I mean, that, but the people of Ukraine are doing enough to engage with those people? I mean, I certainly think that there are a significant number of efforts by different parts of the government, be it with regards to the Ministry of Education, with regards to schooling, be it um, the Office of the Commissioner on Gender Policy, mm -hmm. um, to support survivors of conflict-related sexual violence or, or gender-based violence, but also I think the significant efforts that have been made by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and the consular offices abroad to support Ukrainians to obtain documents. And I think um, what we see also um, from these intention surveys that we've been conducting is that the ability of Ukrainians um, displaced abroad, so refugees to come back and visit um, and to assess the situation, um, to renew their documents, to visit with family members, um, to understand the situation and how it's changed, is a really important way for them to maintain those linkages with Ukraine. Um, and what we also see is that that supports and helps people to make an informed decision about when it's right for them to return home to Ukraine. So I think There's also, a, a, I think, um, at least this is one of the things that UNHCR is advocating for, that, you know, countries of asylum, so members of so EU states mm -hmm. that are hosting Ukrainian refugees maintain this flexible policy so that Ukrainians can come back for a, a visit to see how the situation is for up to a, per a period of up to three months so that they can understand better if they're able to, to reintegrate here. So I think there's obligations on, on many sides to help support Ukrainians to make that decision and to retain that linkage um, with Ukraine. In accordance with your report, um, there are key audience for refugees, yes, at least. It's the women with kids, uh, with high education, with quite a good profile. Yes, and uh, if to follow this like a periodical reports, we see that uh, more and more of them are finding jobs abroad, Uh, like uh, starting to rent the flats, not just like a consume the social um, uh, assistance. And this is one of the threat which is discussed here, yes, in Ukraine, that um, uh, Polish government, for example, said that Ukrainian refugees uh, already paid in taxes uh, the amount of money, which is almost equal to what they spent for supporting them. And we do understand that many European countries are interested in like uh, this uh, employment um, in, in these people because they are highly qualified, they're responsible. How to cope with this? Yes, we, we have this interest of European countries with their like supporting their economies. Uh, we do understand that uh, you cannot live just like a few years just sitting and waiting. You start to organize your life abroad. But this is the huge threat. This is like a huge part of Ukrainian people who can deliver here uh, in this economy. We have broken families. Uh, what is your v vision of this? What's what's better strategy could be? I think what we see at least over the the four rounds of refugee surveys that we've conducted in in 2022 and 2023 is that the the linkage that Ukrainian refugees have to home and their desire to return home has re remained relatively stable over time. So 76% of Ukrainian refugees living abroad still have a hope to return home, including 15% who say that they intend to return home Is this in the next different from other like refugees? Because from what I heard, for example, from my UK friends in the government, they said that This is absolutely non-typical picture for refugees, such kind of uh, desire to uh, come back home. Indeed, I think we are seeing very high rates of intentions to return. It's certainly, I think, one of the situations that's a little bit atypical because we've started to conduct these intention surveys very quickly. Oftentimes, um, in other refugee contexts, we may not be conducting these surveys as quickly because certainly in a situation like this where the the war is continuing. But I think um, certainly I think the linkage that Ukrainian refugees have with home and the desire to return home is certainly very high. So going coming back, back to, oh, yes. Coming yes, going back, back to, to your question, exactly. So, I mean, I think from a 
from a UNHCR perspective, what we have seen with Ukrainian refugees integrating is actually a, a success story because it's actually an investment in the human capital and the capacity of Ukrainian refugees abroad to be able to then come back to Ukraine and contribute to the reconstruction here. As you said, you don't want people sitting for years not you know, developing their skills, not developing um, their economic resilience, um, you know, having children that are well-educated and, you know, well-adjusted, living lives as normal children. I mean, all of this is an important, I think, asset as well for Ukraine, because when these people come back, they will have skills, their children will be well-educated, um, they will be, I hope, well-adjusted. But I think the fact, as you mentioned before, of family separation, the fact that, you know, it's women and children not necessarily with their family members, that's also we see a strong um, motivator for people to want to return home, to be reunified um, with their families. So I think, you know, we can see this, I think, in, in many ways. But I do think the fact that Ukrainians have been able to integrate um, temporarily into these countries is a, is a success story in many ways for the reception um, and asylum systems in many EU member states that they have been able to to yeah. step up and to to accept um, and to you know receive these people in conditions of dignity and safety and to integrate them into their national systems but it's also an investment in these Ukrainians that will support their return and eventually we hope the reconstruction of Ukraine Yeah, and uh, we also discuss a lot here locally that these people are some kind of advocators because uh, for many years Europe actually didn't know Ukrainians. Ukraine, what are the difference between Russians and Ukrainians? And that was always like a, some kind of hit in Ukrainians because we consider ourselves a separate nation. Uh, but uh, for now on, people accepting people and this people diplomacy, I think, will also play a huge role afterwards because people will understand. What do you think about it? I certainly think the reception and the generosity of many states has been remarkable and it's not something that we we always see um, from a UNHCR perspective. So I think that is very positive. And indeed, I do think that, as you say, um, you know, refugees, not just Ukrainian refugees, but certainly in this instance, Ukrainian refugees are um, great diplomats or envoys, as you say, um, to help people better understand the places where they come from. Um, certainly, you said, uh, you know, that at the beginning of the interview that I'm, I'm Canadian. And as you know, there's a mm -hmm. significant Ukrainian diaspora that was in Canada long before, yeah. um, you know, February 2022. And certainly, I mean, we know in Canada that Ukrainians were um, significant contributors to the building of Canada, mm -hmm. the railroads, um, the agricultural sector and other things. So I think certainly it's good that, um, I mean... It's unfortunate, the situation that we have here, but as you say, it is an opportunity to show the resilience and the remarkable um, capacities and skills um, that Ukraine has here and how they can contribute um, to the world. Yeah. D d did you make some kind of specific research of the kids' mood? Like uh, there are many children there and yeah, they just now in schools and universities. Uh, from what I see in my bubble, yes, this, most of these kids want to come home. Uh, they said that, okay, we'll take the studies here, but then we're coming home. But maybe there is some figures about this. So we haven't conducted a specific um, survey with with a focus on children or or young people, um, but certainly they are amongst the families that we we surveyed. Um, and the indication, as I said, is is that there is a, an intention to return home. But we have not conducted specific, um, you know, studies with with these children. But anecdotal evidence, as you say, mm -hmm. is that children do want to come home and and uh, you know. Uh, start to study again in Ukrainian and and have their friends and their communities around them. I think that's an important um, challenge for refugee children everywhere is to be uprooted and to be moved away from your home, your friends, your community, your extended family, that network that helps you, you know, be a, a well-adjusted child. Um, mm -hmm. And I think, you know, 
forcible displacement is often most tragic for for young people because it does have that disrupting influence. They're often the most resilient, um, but I think it's why it's really important that um, you know the international community really invest in education and psychosocial support and other activities that really support Ukrainian children, whether they're displaced abroad or displaced here inside Ukraine, because they will be the next generation um, that will, you know, participate in the reconstruction of Ukraine. And it's really important to invest in their development. Okay. Um, you said that uh, European uh, systems quite well worked in this situation from the point of view, except in refugees. Uh, but we have problem of IDPs inside Ukraine starting from 2014. I mean, the, like uh, those who are Ukrainians and those who are moved from occupied territories. And I cannot say that till the last year we cope with this very good because you remember the problem which we had, for example, that refugees till the latest time didn't have a right to vote for eight years. We didn't solve the voting rights for them. We didn't develop the system of how to support them on a local and governmental level. And now we faced with this flood of internally displaced persons. Uh, what's the difference in moods of IDPs and refugees? What's the difference in, uh, I don't know, intentions of them? Uh, and uh, are those who are IDPs satisfied now with the governmental uh, strategy to support them? So, In terms of the different intentions between uh, refugees and internally displaced persons, I think they're relatively similar. So as I said earlier, 76% of um, refugees and 82% of internally displaced um, Ukrainians intend to return home. And about 15% of both refugees and internally displaced Ukrainians say that they want to return home in the next three months. Um, and as I said earlier, that... Um, that percentage has remained relatively stable over time in 2022 and 2023. Certainly what we see um, is, I mean, we haven't um, surveyed satisfaction um, with certain government policies, mm -hmm. but what we do see is that people still want to return home And those who wish to locally integrate are increasingly finding opportunities to do so. We see that local authorities in a number of Western and Central oblasts are making efforts to integrate um, internally displaced persons mm -hmm. into um, the services of the Departments of Social Protection, um, but also into schools um, and increasingly into labor markets. And I think in some instances, we've really seen local communities um, – not only welcome uh, mm -hmm. the the displaced uh, populations who are currently living there, but also to increasingly see this as an opportunity um, to develop uh, community centers, integration hubs to improve uh, livelihood and, and job opportunities um, because there are these different skills and different capacities that people bring from a different part of, of Ukraine. Coming back to your research again, 94% said that uh, for them, the enablers of the decision to come would be the security situation. Yes. That's obvious. And this is, let's say, our armed forces and governmental task. And 91 said that uh, for them is of high importance is to have access to basic services like housing, yes. uh, I don't know, schools, hospitals and so on. Is this your focus for recovery? or how you manage, what you're focusing on, what are your priorities and what are specific projects which you are doing here? So I think for UNHCR, indeed, um, together as part of, you know, to support the government and as part of an interagency, United Nations um, and international community response, our focus is on how we can support the government to create these conditions for return. So these, the restoration of government services um, and also um, infrastructure and social infrastructure that will support people um, to return home. So for UNHCR, um, we have a particular focus on, on housing um, protection um, and other forms of material support that we hope will create the conditions for people to want to return home and to support those who have already returned home to be able to remain there. So, for example, in areas where we know um, that there's already been significant returns or where we expect there to be returns. For example. So in areas uh, like Kiev City and Kiev Oblast, 
Kharkiv, uh, Mykolaiv, and Chernihiv. Um, we have uh, already um, repaired a significant number of homes, um, provided legal assistance to, to support people to uh, restore either their personal identity documentation or their property documentation so they can um, obtain compensation or proof that this is their home. Um, and um, we also provide um, other forms of material support, um, such as household items, but also cash assistance to support people to, to restart their lives. And so we use the findings of our intention surveys, mm -hmm. together with the information that we know about areas where people have already returned home, to really focus on these recovery, these community reconstruction efforts. And uh, when you say housing, so this is like money for repair and houses actually for those whose houses were destroyed, yes? So we have um, a different ways that we can support mm -hmm. people. So indeed, um, we can provide people with shelter materials so mm -hmm. that they can conduct the repairs themselves. We also have um, contractors who can help in particular vulnerable families who can't conduct the, the repairs themselves. And so this can range from fixing people's roofs, replacing windows, doors, um, walls, and other things. Um, we also, in the lead up to, to winter, will be supporting people with damaged houses to insulate their homes mm -hmm. against the winter so that they can remain in their houses rather than having to be displaced because of the cold. And um, we also have piloted prefabricated Ukrainian-built mm -hmm. um these prefabricated housing units mm -hmm. that we have piloted in uh, Chernihiv and in Kiev oblasts. And we place these prefabricated units into people's uh, land plots mm -hmm. where they have completely damaged homes um, so that they can have a place to live in their own land while they rebuild their homes. So there is a variety of ways um, that we provide support to people's ability to rebuild or to, to insulate their homes so that um, they do indeed have a protective environment and that they can stay um, where they are and, and don't have to be um, displaced again. Let's come a little bit upper now. <laughs> yes. So um, this is the huge crisis really for Ukraine, for the whole world. You as the person which saw already like many of such tragedies, do you see a uh, necessity to change somehow the common rules of uh, common policies? Do you make some recommendations to government how to work better with IDPs, with refugees? Does it influence, I don't know, to European perception of how the refugees should be managed or maybe how to prevent refugee crises? Well, certainly these are big questions. I hope that Europe has learned um, as a result of the, the very quick response. And I think um, in many ways, the, the way that they were able to quickly, um, with the Temporary Protection Directive, provide um, regularized status to mm -hmm. a large number of people very quickly. So both the Ukrainian nationals, but also the, the third country nationals who were also forced to flee mm -hmm. as a result of the full-scale invasion. I think there are a number of things that we can learn about the response, both outside, but also inside. And indeed, I mean, Ukraine has been a leader in, in, in many respects in the way that it has dealt um, with the situation of internal displacement. It has legislation on internal displacement. There's a developed system of provision of financial support to people who are forcibly displaced. And the government, I think, is working on innovative and new ways to think about how to find solutions to displacement. And also what we see is a, a whole of government um, response um, with the Ministry of Reintegration, the Ministry of Infrastructure, the Ministry of Social Policy, all trying um, in a joined up way to pilot new and innovative ways to provide support to people who are displaced, but also to lead and to guide the international community and the rest um, and, and, you know, the humanitarian community to find ways to already begin this early recovery and, and community recovery stage. So I think there are a number of things that we can already learn, and I hope that we will be able to then learn later as well as a result of, of this, because what we really see is that the government of Ukraine is in the lead, and this is in many situations not not the case. Um, because here what we really see is that the, the government wants to support its displaced population um, and also um, has a strong leadership role um, in coordinating the international response. 
another story about refugees, which looks like a very uh, interesting now. And yes, I do understand also that probably this is not the Ukrainian uh, covering story, but the misuse of uh, refugees as a threat to European countries. Yes, what what Belarusia is doing, they um, bring in the uh, refugees, actually immigrants, illegal immigrants to the border of Poland and try with them, like with the stick, um, uh, press to make a pressure on European countries. Have you ever uh, faced such a misuse of the uh, people in other situation and have your organization ever tried to cope with this somehow? So I think it's important to remember that it's the responsibility of the state um, upon whose territory people mm-hmm. are for their their protection. And I think an important role for, for UNHCR is to remind these states that it is their responsibility to protect people on their territory but also that states have a responsibility to accept people who are seeking international protection. And indeed, this is becoming increasingly challenging in in an era, um, I think, where these issues can become politicized. But I think from a UNHCR perspective, um, the principles underlying the 1951 Refugee Convention remain as relevant as they were in 1951. And I think It's important um, that not only UNHCR, but that other member states, the UN as a whole, um, continue to remind states of these important principles and that these are are upheld um, because of the, the fundamental right that people have to seek safety and to seek international protection if they cannot have the protection of their own state. Okay, so to finalize, what you see uh, as a focus for the mission for the future? Maybe not this year, because actually I don't think that this year the um, uh, challenges will be different. But in five year perspective, uh, what would be your efforts mainly focused to? So I hope that in five years we will have peace and that we will be continuing to support a return population here. So I think, um, you know, how we can support people to integrate um, back in their homes or for people who are unable or unwilling to return home, that they're able to to integrate into um, the communities where they have found um, safety. I also hope um, that we will have a significant uh, voluntary repatriation program that will have already completed in five years because those, as we know, the, the intention to return home is strong amongst Ukrainian refugees. And I think the other thing um, that, I mean, for UNHCR will continue to be a, a priority is to support the government to to prevent and reduce the risk of statelessness. So ensuring that you know, all people with an undetermined nationality are able to to determine their nationality and to have a, a legal identity, but also that um, we're able to, you know, resume uh, the work that we had conducted, that we had been doing with the government of Ukraine on improving the, the asylum system here inside Ukraine. So Ukrainians have found um, asylum abroad. We also know that Ukraine has offered in the past um, asylum to others who have come to Ukraine. And I hope that we're in five years able to have already, you know, moved quite far um, on the road of of reforming Ukraine's own own asylum system. And that's an important part also of the um, EU integration project of of Ukraine. So I hope that for for UNHCR, many of those tasks will already be done. And a sign of success is when UNHCR is able to leave a country because it means that there are no more refugees um, and no more forcibly displaced persons. Um, Perhaps this is an overly optimistic view, but certainly... Maybe not. I think I hope not. yes, indeed. No, I think with strong international support, but also I think um, you know the innovation, the the digital um, literacy, um, and I think the the resilience of of the Ukrainian people. Perhaps this is something that is possible. Uh, you came here last year, and it was your first visit and stay in Ukraine. Yes. Yes, this was my first visit and stay in Ukraine. Yes. So, from your personal opinion, yes, uh, your personal view. How you see Ukraine now and what would be your like uh, recommendations where we should move as a nation from the point of view of the person who never saw Ukraine before? So I think Ukraine never ceases to to amaze me. 
I mean, the people are incredibly resilient. Um, my colleagues in the office can spend all night in um, the bomb shelters with their children and then show up in the office early the next day, ready to take on a full day of work. Um, so I think, you know, I certainly take that lesson away is, um, you know, the importance of resilience and in believing in a, a cause um, and also in, you know, their desire to help their own their own fellow citizens. So I think I've taken away a very important lesson um, by coming here. Um, but I do think the ongoing efforts of the government to already begin talking about recovery now are very important um, because I think that is that will give hope um, not only to refugees but to internally displaced persons that there are already efforts that are ongoing to support them if they do return home, and also that the government is working to create those conditions so that people can return home when they feel that they're ready to do so. So I think these are very important um, elements that will contribute to, you know, maintaining that linkage between people who are displaced and their homes, but also will continue to support these strong intentions that we see for people wanting to return home. That investment in infrastructure, in social services, in housing, in transportation, in the energy sector, but also in livelihoods and in education and with social workers. These are all important, I think, investments and contributions that will continue to support this strong intention to, to return home and, and to want to contribute to the reconstruction of Ukraine. Karen, thank you so much for uh, you being here with me. And I really hope that in five years we will uh, discuss another topics. And I hope that in the whole world after this big war, we will have less refugees who are uh, leaving their country's home because of war. And I hope that international system will uh, not only adopt to the situation, but recover itself to prevent the next big war. And I think that this is the lessons learned we all need to do, that we need to put a lot of efforts in preventing crises more than coping with it. Thank you one more time and thank you for the, your efforts here. And we, as Ukrainians, we do always appreciate the assistance of our friends. And um, I think that uh, coming back to... I wanted to ask you about the UN, but I won't. <laughs> Oh. This is one one of the questions I'm asking the many, many people. And I think that really UN system should be modernized and uh, transformed very seriously. But what your agency is doing here, it's really impressive and good job. And I think that many people appreciate it. And this is the good example of how the joint efforts can can be joined. Yes, in, especially in, in crisis moments. So thank you. Thank you very much. It was a real pleasure. Just to remind you that it was Safe and Safe Country podcast and my name is Alina Frolova. Our podcast is done together with the Center for Defense Strategies, Ukrainska Pravda and Media Center Ukraine. And you can find us on uh, most of the platforms and on resources of Ukrainska Pravda. Don't forget to subscribe and to receive updates. The Safe and Safe Country, all of us can influence on how soon the world unsafe will disappear. Thank you. Thank you.